So uh, chapter 37 of the book of Psalms, uh, it's a Psalm of David here. You know, the Psalms have lots of authors. We have uh, Moses and Solomon and Korah and uh, Asaph and Heman and Ethan. Even Hezekiah writes a Psalm. Uh, you know, but this one is a Psalm of David, you know, the Hebrew hymn book. And David is the great psalmist of Israel. He was the one that wrote so many of these. And I love it when they say it's a Psalm of David. You know, think about King David. He was the general of the IDF. I don't know if you guys know this. The IDF is one of the most intense armed forces in the world right now. They have no idea what they're dealing with. If they ever had to have a war and it went out un unleashed, <laughs> whoever comes against Israel is going to be in trouble. I've been to Israel three times. I've seen they never have a lack of their weapon. It's with them 24 hours a day. I've been out the Dead Sea and seen some young ladies. You know, they were in their shorts and their bikini tops and on their back, M16. That's the idea. You sleep with the thing. I mean, they're ready for action, and you just walk at the security all around when you're there. It's just amazing. David, going way back, really, the general of the IDF, he was a shepherd boy and made the king. You know, you know, you know, David, the giant killer, lopped off Goliath's head. I mean, the guy's amazing. And God says of David, though, this is what's really amazing, is that he's a man after my own heart. You guys remember that? Why do you think God said that of David? You know, and I, I ponder that, and I think it's kind of this. I mean, there's sure, um, there was lots of reasons why he would say that. God knew him intimately and personally, but I think it's because David loved his sheepfold. He never took his eyes off his sheepfold. He loved the people. He loved his sheep. And by the way, his sheep was all of Israel. And so uh, even with his riches and honor and all the things the king receives, he never stopped loving his sheep, his people. He never stopped pastoring them like he did as a shepherd boy. You know, pastors, we're called to feed the lambs as a shepherd would. We're, as fathers, we're called to love our children. As mothers, we're called to love our little ones. You know, we can all be as David was as far as loving the people that God has entrusted to us. And that makes God happy. And so David did that. He never stopped observing. He never stopped watching them. He never stopped encouraging them, even exhorting them and uh, even admonishing them when they needed it. You know, and that's what this psalm is about. It's about observation and exhortation from King David. And, and when did he write it? Well, verse 25 tells us he did it when he was old. And so we don't know the exact reason, but obviously he saw something. And so in verses 1 through 8, in Psalm 37, it says this, Do not fret because of evildoers. Nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. Okay, first thing we want to look at, the first thing we can do in 2016 to draw closer to the Lord is something we should not be doing. Do not do this, David says. Do not fret. That's a com not a very common word, yet we see it all the time in people. You look at them and they're kind of faces downcast, maybe a little upset, a little angry. You know, the, the wrinkles on the forehead get down really close to the eyebrow, and you're like, what's going on with that? As we were worshiping, I was thinking about someone I see fretting, and I, it really bothers me. I, my little daughter has a tendency to fret sometimes, and I don't like to see that look on her face. You know, fretting is a weird thing. It literally means to be hot, to burn, to be angry. You know, and we see it kind of sometimes. I like to describe it as maybe pouting or moping or something like that. It has a lot of various um, manifestations in itself. To understand fretting better, I like it in the New Living Translation. It says, don't worry. You don't worry. In the message, don't bother 
don't bother your head, it says. And of course, the Amplified, fret not. And then, of course, in the ESR, which I didn't even know there was an ESR. That means the easy read version. I'm like, I have to try that one sometimes. It says, don't get upset. So that helps to understand what fretting is. And so here's David observing his people, and uh, they were upset, and they were fretting. He could see it in their face. You know, and he could see what was going on with so many of them, you know, and it tells us why there. It says, because of evildoers, you know, obviously the enemies of Israel, perhaps, or maybe the evil people in their own politics. That happened a lot. We can read about that in the kings, the good king, a bad king, a good king, a bad king, perhaps. Maybe the criminals among them. Maybe uh, other things. You know, the world doesn't change much. David was observing his people. Maybe it was the economic collapse. I find it interesting that that used to be the big scare of America was the economic collapse, and now that doesn't even matter anymore because now it's the ideology of, of death that's really upon us. I mean, lots of things that they were fretting over, and David says, fret not. And then he says in verse 1, 2, be, nor be envious of the worker of iniquity. So the problems of the world, and then, of course, the other people, the workers that are working for all the things, maybe the big house, the fast car. You know, three times in eight verses, David says, do not fret. You know, maybe it was the big house, the big car. Maybe it was the girls with the big hair. I don't know. Whatever it was, is all the things are any good if they're done through iniquity, is what David is really saying. You don't want anything that was gotten in an improper way. You know, don't be envious of that stuff, he says. You know, and I say desire nothing apart from the Lord. If the Lord doesn't want you to have it, you shouldn't have it because he knows what's best for us. I go after things sometimes and I'm like, did the Lord really want me to have it? I found out he probably didn't. Such hard lessons to learn when we have it right here. Don't, you know, be envious of the things that the Lord doesn't want you to have. Because notice their fate, verse 2. They're cut down like grass. And it says soon, too. You know, they wither like the green herb. You know, a biblical perspective is so important. You know, it's coming soon. The Spirit is saying it's very temporal. When we see these things around us and we're like, oh, that, look at that person. They have that and this is going on and I don't want that. I want that, blah, blah, blah. It's so temporal. We want to look at the, the eternal. We want to look at heaven's perspective because heaven's better, remember? It's a heavenly perspective that we want to see. You know, and it's soon. It's coming soon for the, for the ungodly, for the, and, you know, the workers of iniquity. You ever seen a guy mow the grass before they're so fast at it? You know, hey, time is money. Get in, get out, do it right, get to the next house. It's the same thing. It's coming so fast. It doesn't last. We want the eternal. Okay. So verse 3, now David says, this is what you do. Instead of those things, instead of fretting, he says, number, verse 3, number 1, the first one, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. You know, we you know, oh, well, yeah, we say that a lot, and yeah, 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 okay. You know, believe and trust and faith are all kind of synonymous. They all kind of work together. And without them, you have, you know, serious issues. He says, trust in the Lord. Trust is something that, again, is easily said. But when you're doing it, there's not much that needs to be said. I find that is a truth. Just if you trust in the Lord, people just see it. There's not a lot of talk. And then you hear a lot of times, oh, the Lord this, the Lord that. And then yet you see what's going on. And you're like, oh, man, I want to just do it without saying it. And that's what David says. Just trust in the Lord. You know, we have 66 books that tell us all the things that he asks us to trust him in. So many things to look at. And he says, you will, do, you will do good. You know, and it is when your mind's focused on the Lord and you're trusting him, you do do good. Second one, verse three. He says, dwell in the land. Dwell in the land. <clears throat> I think a lot of Christians have the idea that unless they've gone on the missions field or they've moved a mountain for the Lord, you know, Jesus said, hey, you can move mountains, no problem. You know, it's some great spiritual accomplishment. If you've done that, you, you know, if you, unless you've done that, uh, uh, you know, or some exceptional thing, maybe you pray for someone, they were healed, or whatever it may be, if you haven't done any of those things, you're a failure, or you're not successful. That's not true. That's absolutely not true. I think if you do what David says to do here, verse 3, dwell, notice, in the land, 
That is just huge. Just dwell in the land. To them, as he's writing this to Israel, the land is the land of promise. You read the book of Exodus, you read you know, all the things that came about when God was taking them into that promised land the first time, the Hebrews were going to dwell there and live there. That was their goal. That was God's promise for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it still is, and he's finally fulfilled it. He's brought them all back, back into that land. That was the promised land. To just dwell there and be a part of God's plan for their life and do that, that was huge. You know, every day living with the Lord in the land of promise, it was huge. It was a priority for them that they wouldn't forget who they were and where they were. And you could take it and just move it forward, fast forward Jesus Christ and then add 2,000 years, here we are. The promises of God are all, you know, of course, yes and amen. The promises of God are for us to dwell in. And that is huge for 2016 to just dwell in God's promises and dwell in his son. You know, it's like, he says in the Revelation, I'm coming soon. That's a huge promise. You could just dwell in that on every day. All right, Lord, today's the day. You know, and if you get 10 o'clock at night and you get ready to go to bed, and today's the day, okay, no problem. Go to bed, wake up next morning. All right, today, today's the day. That's the promise that we have. That's just dwelling with the Lord, just not forgetting who you are. You're a child of God, and he's actually got the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, and just dwell with him and also, you know, and don't forget who you are. You're the one that he loves. That's his promises. And so for them, just dwell with the Lord. Take it from there. You know, that's step one, priority one. And maybe someone hasn't been doing that, you know. As uh, Roman was saying, you know, it's important to go through your Bible every, well, two years is a realistic goal. I try and read my Bible every year. I read it every year, Genesis to Revelation that's my goal. So I'm fresh every year. And so anyway, we want to just dwell with the Lord. Okay, verse three, the next one, I just absolutely love. I'm like, this is all here. You know, this is the surefire way to end fretting in your life right here. Notice verse three, feed on his faithfulness. That verse is on fire. You should take a highlighter, underline it with red pen and then highlight it with yellow so it looks like it's on fire. That's what I do, this is my colors. Feed on his faithfulness. Wow, do I do that? Well, look to Jesus. Jesus is always the perfect example. If you ever want an example of how you should be doing and acting, doing something, always look to Jesus. Draw to him. Feed on his faithfulness. Jesus, the perfect example. You guys remember Matthew chapter 4? The devil comes to tempt Jesus. Thought he was going to trip Jesus up. And all he ended up doing was just making God look good again, glorifying the Lord in the sinless perfection of the Son. Hey, Jesus, I know you've been a little hungry because you haven't eaten in 40 days. Why don't you make these stones right here into bread? Let's see how good you really are. And what did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He was feeding on God's faithfulness. He knew God was going to see him through. He knew the Lord was going to do for him what he needed, you know, in sustaining him. He was living and feeding on God's faithfulness. Then how about John chapter 4, the woman at the well? Jesus, once again, our example. This is the one I really like. Jesus in ministry, doing ministry, <coughs> spends time with the Father in the morning praying, and the Lord says, you're going to go through this little town, and you're going to meet someone that needs to meet me, and you're going to introduce them, and whole thing you know the woman at the well he meets the woman at the well jesus gets the disciples hey you guys go in town and get some food i'll be out here hanging out for a minute they had a great conversation he totally just drew out all the problems in her life and basically said i'm here i got you covered and she just was so excited she met him you know goes running off into town come see a man who told me everything i ever did i love the story john chapter four and then the disciples come and you know, Rabbi, we encourage you, you need to eat. This is a long walk to get over here. And remember what Jesus told them? Hey, I have food that you know nothing about. And he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Guys, that is feeding on his faithfulness. Finding out what God wants to do. Uh, and I, honestly, you can pull off 10, 12, 14 hours without food when you're doing the service of the Lord because God sustains, God gives you the strength to do it. And that's an interesting thing. It's an interesting concept, but it is so true. It's so good. 
doing the will of the Father, doing the work of the Lord, is feeding on his faithfulness, enjoying him, discovering how much better the Lord is than even a steak dinner, you know, with all the fixings. God is just able to do that. And just, you know, put it into yourself. Pour it into yourself. Allow yourself to experience feeding on God's faithfulness. I encourage you to do that. God satisfies in an amazing way when we serve him, when we experience him. You know, I can say stop being malnutritioned. You know, I found myself malnutritioned, and that was with plenty of food around. It wasn't that. It was just I wasn't letting God do something, and then you just let him do it, and it's just an amazing feeling. It's amazing satisfaction. Verse 4, the next one. Delight yourself also in the Lord. Okay, delight yourself in the Lord. I like it in the message translation. Keep company with the Lord. You know, if I could have anyone over at the house, out of any choice, I would want Jesus to come over to the house. That would be an amazing thing. Keep company with the Lord. That's delighting yourself in the Lord. Delighting is taking joy in. It's rejoicing in. It's a.k.a. you love to be with him. The Lord is the one we should love to be with. Really, it's just loving him, delighting in him. You know, this verse is not what a lot of people think, though. You read it, and then they see, okay, delight yourself in the Lord, and then he gives you all the desires of your heart. He shall give you all the desires of your heart. Oh, man, cool. Get that new truck. You know, I want that new, I don't know, boat or something. (laughs) Or I should probably have my eye on that nice, shiny, four-carat diamond. I don't know. That's really not what it is. It's, quite, it's actually quite the opposite, really. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, you know, it's not carte blanche. It's not Visa, MasterCard, shop to you drop. No, it's the Lord doing something in you because to delight in the Lord is to go by all the things that he tells us to do, like denying ourselves, you know, picking up our cross daily and following Jesus and all those things, being in the word and time of prayer and everything. But when you do that, notice that God gives you the desires. He puts his desire into your heart. He changes your heart. His will becomes your will. And that's one thing that's so important for people is in prayer is that's where your will is changed at the time of prayer, time of the word. But notice God puts his desires in your heart. They become your desires. His desire becomes your desire. And that's better. You know, for 2016, let yourself delight in him. You know, just surrender. Just give it to him. I've found that I've lived a long time and I've had desires and things. There were three things I always wanted to do and God fulfilled two of them and I thought I really had to have that last one and he gave it to me and I realized I didn't really want it. (laughs) I wish I would have just let him do what he wanted to do. So we have to be careful. Just let him put his desires in your heart because they're better. You know, so already, rather than fretting, we have trusting, we have dwelling, we have feeding on his faithfulness. Now we have delighting ourselves in him or just getting started verse five he says mr david says commit your way to the lord trust also in him commit your way to the lord that used to be a really scary word for me commit like commitment oh you know i finally kind of somewhat grew up and i understand commitment now but might be a little scary to to some still, but hey, when it's committing to the Lord, that should come easy. You know, and us, what do we commit to him? Our way. You know, the way we choose, the road we follow. You know, Jesus left really us with two choices. You know, broad is the road and wide is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the road that leads to righteousness. You know, very few find it, he said. Really, it's just the way that we're going to go. Well, what are we going to do? Well, if you just commit it to the Lord, he says, God says, I'll bring it to pass. He shall bring it to pass. You know, there's nothing in our life. Well, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what to do. Just tell the Lord, say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what to do, but I want to give it to you. Take me, lead me, and he will. That is a great thing for us in these coming, you know, the coming year. We can't see down those other roads. We don't know what's there. I know there's a lot of billboards that want to lead you off on the wrong exit for sure. That's what you have to be careful. I mean, I used to drive out to San Bernardino for whatever reason. They used to have all these gentlemen's club signs out there. And I got in the habit um, of rebuking and praying them and asking God to burn the building down, you know, and just that no one would see them when they were driving by and things like that. No, we want to be on God's right way. 
you know, commit. In the ASV, again, it says, depend on the Lord, and he shall bring it to pass. He will make it happen. You know, in our times of uncertainty, we want to be on the one solid rock road that Christ is that solid rock. He's the only sure thing, and he will lead us the right way when we commit ourselves to him. He brings forth our righteousness, it says there in verse 6. He'll bring forth the righteousness as the light. You know, these truths are rock solid. This is absolutes right here. They're possible. They're practical. And starting today, we can commit ourselves to the Lord Jesus, and then he brings forth our righteousness. You know, it's a fact. It's a point. Nobody can go to heaven for one very simple reason, a lack of righteousness. They don't have it. We don't have it. There's a whole list of them in Romans chapter 6, I think it is, that you can read about how there's none good, no, not righteous, and the whole list of them from the Old Covenant. Hey, we don't have it. We can't make it. But when we have Christ, he gives us that righteousness. He's the one that brings us into heaven. It's by his righteousness. That's an amazing thing. And so Jesus says, or, you know, the Lord says here, I will make your righteousness shine. Uh as sure as the sun comes up every day, God says, I will make your righteousness shine too. You know, I almost missed this in verse 6 too. He says, justice too, as the noonday. And I like it in the New Living, verse 6 in the New Living. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. You guys, did you know that you have a cause? You know, what's my cause? We have a cause. Our cause is Christ. That's our cause. And our justice is Christ. He's our justice. Justice is getting very, very hard to find in these last days that we're living in. It is the end days we're living in. And I'm sure Pastor Rubens told you that. We are so close. But justice is getting harder and harder to find. But I can tell you for certainty, God has not lost any of his justice. And all of his justice is we're going to is going to come to pass, and he starts with us. He makes our righteous justice cause Christ, and he makes it shine. You know, hey, that is amazing right there. David, knowing these things before Christ even came, you know it's just totally empowered by the Spirit here. And so are we willing to wait for it? He says, verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. It's Sometimes it takes a while, but we wait, and we rest you know, if you rest, it helps you wait. Doesn't rest sound so good? See, she's yawning. She says she needs a nap. I love naps. You know, that's how you know you're getting old, because when you were young, you hated naps. They made you take a nap. And you know, in kindergarten, give your little milk, go take a nap. No. Nowadays, hey, why don't you go take a nap? Okay. It's fun. No, that's not what it means, though. He's not talking about sleep. He's talking about rest. Genesis 2 account. The creation account, God creates six days, does all the stuff. The seventh day, it says that he rested. He saw everything that he did was good, and God rested. It is, it's not that he was tired. It's that God was finished. He did what he was going to do. That's what really what resting in the Lord is, is knowing that it's finished. It means you can stop fretting, stop struggling with mucho problemos, and just rest in the Lord because it's finished. He's made all of the things possible. Our salvation is complete in Christ. You know, it's a finished work. Salvation is 100% complete. Remember Jesus, John 19, 30, to tell us that it is finished. He did the work. It's all done. And so there's no work to do. Remember John 6, when Jesus feeds the 5,000 people, you know, and then he gets the leftovers to the disciples and they hang out for a while. And then Jesus says, hey, I want you guys to get in the boat, go across the sea, and I'll meet you over there. Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray looking at him out there struggling at the oars and the whole thing. And he gets over there to the other side, and then the people show up, and they kind of couldn't figure out how he got there, but what they were interested in was the bread, you know, and then they said, well, maybe we should ask him what work we have to do to get this every time, you know, what work do we have to do? And Jesus said, you know, basically said, rest. It's finished already. Just believe in the one God has sent. That is our rest. If we continually remember it day by day as we walk along, it's going to make a huge difference. And so we have to wait. We have to wait for the Lord. Verse 7 says there, you've got to wait for the Lord Jesus. We can dwell. We can trust. We can feed. We can delight. We can rest. 
but there is some waiting involved. Pastoral confession right here, I hate to wait. I had enough red lights in the 45 years I lived in California to last me a million lifetimes. And I get back over here and I'm like, oh man, I remember these things now. You know, stop. There, okay, get to go again. Stop. I, I just, I freak out. I don't know, I'm sorry. I don't like to wait. I have a hard time waiting for a hot dog to cook 30 seconds in the microwave. That's called God working. <laughs> if you know what I mean. But we have to wait on the Lord. Um, and he says, notice, wait patiently. Hey, when you're not feeling like you should be waiting and you're not feeling patient, you know what God's doing? He's testing you to see, hey, how you doing on that patience lately? I just thought I'd check up on you and see how you're doing there. And I, I remember now what I used to do when I get to a red light and I was frustrated, I'd get my Bible out and get it off the seat, open it up, start reading it, and then immediately the horn would start honking behind me because the light turned green. If you want lights to turn green, just get your Bible out and start reading it. <laughs> I remember my California practices I had. Okay, so are we willing to wait for him? He's worth waiting for. He's better than fretting. You know, the Hebrew contrast is such a way that David shares here. Um, don't fret over him, you know, who prospers in his way there in verse 7. You know, here's this contrast again of the other guys out there. Seems like nothing's a problem for them. But again, it's their way. And that way is not good. God's way is good. And in verse 8 there, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Uh, there's an unrighteous anger and wrath, and they're not from the Lord. They're not a fruit of the Spirit. You know, here's David, a warrior king. Obviously, his adrenaline would be pumping when he was in battle. But yet, he understood the difference between uh, righteous anger and unrighteous anger. You know, and the Lord is not for the unrighteous anger and wrath. And I think that's a lot of people struggle with anger sometimes. And hey, he just says, cease from those things and do not fret because it's going to harm you. And it's true. Verse 9 through 11, and I knew I wasn't, there's no way I was going to do the whole thing, but verse 9 through 11, uh, the blessings of waiting for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth yet a little while on, and the wicked shall not be no more. And do your place, or you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. <clears throat> and so evildoers, they're going to be cut off, he says. Hey, you guys, cut off. Read your Old Covenant, your Old Testament. Cut off so often means excluded. It means cast out. It means really destroyed or even perhaps killed, the extreme situation. Okay. Uh, earlier, David said they would be cut down. And I think it's because God was trying to get them to repent, and it didn't work. And then here David says they will be cut off. David is very adamant about this. He knew one thing about sin. He knew sin was sin. He didn't give it a fluffy pillow to lay its head on. He dealt with it accordingly. You know, Romans 6, 23. What is the wages of sin? It's death. It kills you. But those who wait, again, in their contrast here, who wait in the Lord, what do we get? What did Israel get? They shall inherit the earth. That's a little Matthew 5 right there. You know, the meek shall inherit the earth. Again, um, Revelation tells us it's going to be better. One of the things that's coming is a rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. We're going to have dominion over the earth once again. The Bible even tells us, hey, so much so, not only just, you know, the Lord ruling and reigning, you'll be able to stick your child can stick their hand in the cobra's den, pull the cobra out, and not get bit. You know, that's ruling and reigning. That's inheriting the earth. You know, you'll be able to stroke the lion's mane and he won't bite you. All those things. You know, the lion and the lamb will lay down together. It's going to be a great time. That's what God's going to give to the ones that follow after him. You know, and the Lord's going to take over. He is going to do it, but it's going to be by his love and his righteousness and his justice. You know, not to mention he owns the world. He gives it to he, whoever he wants. And so how long do we wait? Think of it. How long do we wait? It tells us to wait. How long? Well, you know, I think of my own pastor, the master pastor, Pastor Chuck, waited over 80 years. And the Lord took him home. You know, we have biblical examples. You guys remember Simeon in Luke chapter 2. He's an old guy. You know, he's probably with this cane, you know. I've been waiting. The Lord Spirit told me I was going to see the Messiah before I go. 
one day, here comes this little baby. Mom and dad bring the little baby in, and he just started rejoicing in the spirit. He got to hold the Messiah. He probably passed shortly after. And then there was another lady there too, uh, Anna. She had been a young lady, got married seven short years. Her husband passed away, and it says 84 years, committed her way, uh, you know, delighted herself in the Lord, spent time in the temple praying for 84 years. She too got to see the little Messiah, Jesus. She waited exactly the amount of right time. And so do we have to wait 80 years? I think not. I could be wrong. Maybe it is 80 years. But hey, does it matter? But verse 10 tells us how long we should wait. Look at verse 10. How long do we wait? A little while. Just a little while. And the wicked shall be no more. You know, against a heavenly viewpoint we should all have. It's just a little while. That's how the Lord looks at it. You know, Peter says, one day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. It's nothing to the Lord. There is no time in heaven. It's better in heaven. And so, um, just a little while, a heavenly viewpoint, and they shall be no more. You know, I want people to be saved. I want the wicked to get saved. That's not what David is saying here. But he also, we want have wickedness come to an end. And so, it's just a little while, and then we won't be able to find them. You know, the psalm is an inheritance of the righteous and the calamity of the wicked. You know, and the meek, he says there in verse 11, shall inherit the earth. Those who delight also get an abundance of peace. Hey, hey, that's one thing we really want to have is peace. And it's not the peace of the world. The world tells Israel, give land for peace. You know, give this up for peace. Do this for peace. None of that works. What we give is ourself to the Lord and he gives us that peace, that abundant peace. And that's something too we can lay hold of.